Okay, let me uh, share my screen here. <clears throat> All right, can you see my presentation? Yes. That's good. Okay, so uh, Scott Curry here, November Sierra 7 Charlie. Um, I'm, uh, I'm one of the volunteers on the Wind Lake development team. I'm, I, I monitor a couple of the different uh, forums and uh, answer folks' questions, or at least try to anyway. Uh, and I do, uh, I do a lot of testing of uh, different configurations and, and all. I, I mostly focus on the VHF and UHF, uh, you know, the FM modes, but um, I, I do uh, HF as well. <clears throat> and uh, when I'm not uh, playing ham radio and all that stuff, I work for the City of Auburn in the Emergency Management Office. Uh, I'm an assistant to the Emergency Manager there. I, I maintain the communication systems and uh, communications team, the ham team that uh, uh, will uh, do our communications activities when we're activated for either an event or exercise or drill or something like that. So what we're going to talk about tonight, Windlink radio interfaces, get, really what I'm going to be talking about is connecting your sound card interface uh, to your radio. Um, and this is, um, it applies also to, you know, if, you, if you're using a TNC or something like that, pretty much the same idea uh, there as well. And again, I'm, I'm focusing mostly on, on uh, VHF and UHF radios, but there's, uh, you know, these same principles apply for the most part for HF operations as well. And uh, I don't have that many slides. Hopefully we'll get through them fairly quickly and, and we'll have some room for uh, questions at the end. So if you have, you know, HF questions, we can, we can certainly attack those as well. So uh, just a little reminder here why uh, sound card digital, um, you know, we, we, had a couple of presentations now. Uh, you know, I know Kevin came on and talked about his um, DRA products. Um, I, I talked about doing, uh, you know, do your your do roll your roll your own uh, digital interface uh, a while back. And so, just kind of a reminder: why would we want to use SoundCard Digital? Uh, first of all, for Winlink, uh, you know, all of the modes or almost all of the modes are supported uh, utilizing a sound card interface. Packet, ARDOP, VAR, HF, or FM uh, are all supported using a sound card interface. Really, the only thing you can't do is pack torque uh, with, a, with a sound card interface. Um, these tend to be less expensive hardware options than, you know, a, a full-blown TNC or multi-mode controller or something like that. Um, and what we have found is, uh, you know, we're, we're utilizing the performance of the host computer to do the uh, uh, signal processing. So we end up with, uh, in my opinion, superior encode and decode performance over a, a typical hardware device. Not to say that somebody couldn't build a very sophisticated hardware device with a, you know, very 16-bit uh, you know, or 32-bit DSP inside there and, and have all the firmware to do that, but nobody is. So <laughs> we have, we tend to have much uh, superior performance uh, utilizing the software that we have available to, to us. And of course, um, not limited to just one link. If you're using other digital modes, uh, they will probably require a sound card interface to do them. So, you know, uh, all of the weak signal stuff that uh, uh, Joe Taylor is doing, uh, FT8, you know, Whisper, all of those different things are all requiring a sound card interface. So uh, we don't only do WinLink, we do other modes as well. A uh, little review on uh, exactly what a sound card interface is. It is really just a simple audio signal interface. Um, as far as the operating system is concerned, it's a, it's a microphone and speakers. You know, it, it does not know that it's connected to a radio. Um, and it is not a TNC. A lot, a lot of times I'll hear people say, you know, I can't get my signal link TNC to work. And usually my response is that's because it's not a TNC. Um, a, a TNC has other functions. Um, it, it certainly it does process the, uh, the analog audio signal, but it, it also implements, typically it implements a, the protocol. So it has a state engine in it, a microprocessor and all of that. Uh, that, that's not true of a sound card interface. So, uh, <coughs> excuse me, our sound card interface may provide gr uh, ground or RF isolation between the radio and the computer. We have found that's not really necessary these days. 
uh, maybe at one point in time that was a bigger concern. It doesn't seem to be as big an issue these days. Sorry, code's getting a little dry already. Uh, of course, it provides the push to talk signal so we can put the radio into transmit when we need to send data and back into receive when we need to receive data. Uh, the sound card interface does not process the modem signals other than converting them from analog to digital and digital to analog. Um, again, those once, once it's done that, it goes off to the software that's running in the host computer to actually do the processing. Uh, <clears throat> and some of them, uh, some of our sound card interfaces may actually have virtual COM ports, VCPs they call them, uh, for doing things like rig control. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more in, in a couple slides. On the host side, you're going to have to be running some host software that's going to actually do the signal processing, the modulation and demodulation of the, the analog signals. And, and of course, it's going to do, be doing the, the timing of putting the radio into transmit and back to receive and, and, and so forth. And it will also implement whatever the data protocol is that we're using. So if you're using packet, for example, we're going to be implementing that um, AX.25 protocol. Or if you're using VARA, we'll, we'll be implementing the VARA protocol. So that happens all on the host computer. It's not done within the, uh, the sound card interface. Um, again, a block diagram here, just kind of looking under the covers a little bit, <clears throat> 30,000 foot level. What does this sound card interface thing look like? Um, <clears throat> And so we've got a USB connection on one side and we've had these analog signals on the other side. This side's going to your radio, this side's going to your computer. Deep down inside, all we have is an audio chip, which is connected to the USB port here. And that audio controller chip then has um, a digital to analog converter and an analog to digital converter inside of it. So uh, when digital data comes in here, we turn it into an analog audio signal and then we'll boost that signal a little bit. And in the case of like this, this would be a typical of a, a signal link here. And we'll have transformer isolation in here to, uh, to do that ground isolation, ground and RF isolation. And then TX audio goes on off out to the radio, to the transmitter. On the receive side, coming back, we've got analog audio coming into um, the interface going through that transformer isolation once again into a little preamp here and then into the audio controller chip where it goes through an analog to digital conversion and then we have uh, digital data going out the USB. Now for um, activating the push to talk lead in the case of something like a signal link it's actually using a Vox circuit so when some of that analog audio comes out of here we tap into that and the box circuit detects that there is analog audio happening and it triggers, in the case of a signal link, it triggers a read relay, which then pulls our push to talk lead to ground. And that puts the radio into transmit. <clears throat> Again, you know, on, on the radio side, we're gonna have analog audio here, okay? And on the USB side, we're gonna have digital, you know, ones and zero kind of things going on. <clears throat> okay. And here, there is the signal link, a typical uh, <clears throat> sound card interface. Probably many of you have one of these. Uh, powered by the USB connection, okay. Uh, relatively inexpensive, about $100. Um, <clears throat> and we have to have a way to connect, you know, we're gonna connect by USB cable to the computer. We have to have a way to connect to, the, to our radio. So we have to have a cable that uh, provides the connection from the back of the signal link to whatever we're going to use on the radio. And there's a couple of different options there and we'll talk about uh, what those options are here in a little bit. And again, uh, signal link utilizes transformers in the audio leads to um, isolate the ground connection. And unfortunately that hurts us a little bit because uh, those audio transformers will limit the audio bandwidth. And so that there will then uh, limit the maximum data speed that we can see through these. Okay, again, um, I am not a TNC. Don't call me a TNC. At least not if you're going to talk to me because I'll make fun of you if you do. <coughs> uh, here's another block diagram, another way we can do this. A little, only a little bit different here, really. Again, we have USB coming into an audio controller chip. Okay, 
and we still have the you know digital to analog and analog to digital conversion going on here <clears throat> and we've got you know again an amplifier going out here and this time we'll drop the uh, ground isolation the the transformer isolation just have capacitive coupling going out to the transmit audio same thing on the receive side no more transformer here just some capacitive coupling going through a, you know a little bit of a preamp and then on into the uh, analog controller chip for push to talk we're going to utilize uh, something called a gpio line a general purpose input output line now on these controller chips these are typically used for you know sound uh, in your computer so hooking up to your speakers and or your microphone that sort of thing <clears throat> so the manufacturer uh, of these controller chips added some general purpose uh, lines in there for for you know switches and lights so you maybe have a volume up and down switch uh, you, you've got a light that blinks that tells you that, you know the, the interface is active things like that it's up to the person who uh, you know builds the uh, interface what they're going to do with these GPIO lines well that's a very handy thing for us to use to fire the push to talk lead so we utilize the GPIO line and, you know, really just when that line goes active, we fire a, a, a transistor here, an MPN transistor, open collector kind of thing, and we pull the push to talk lead to ground. Okay, so this is actually, in my mind, a much better way to do it than Vox, because with Vox, with a Vox circuit, you have to have the level just right to trip the Vox circuit. In this case, you know, when we turn that GPIO line on, the radio is in transmit. When we turn that GPIO line off, the radio is back into receive again. <clears throat> so this would be typical of something like a DRA or a, a rim light or something like that. Uh, this is the, the kind of design you'll see there. And, and these are those very devices here. Here's a, from Masters Communications, a DRA 30. So here's that uh, controller chip right here. In this case, it's the, the C Media CM 119A um, <clears throat> controller chip. And uh, actually, uh, in this case, um, Kevin actually pulls out all of the general purpose IO lines. They're actually available here uh, uh, on, the, on the circuit board, so you could utilize those. But this one right here, GPIO 3, is the one that we use for push to talk. And so that's wired over here to these uh, transistors over here, and that's what fires the, uh, the push to talk lead. Okay. Uh, same thing on the rim over here. Again, uh, CM119A audio controller chip on there. And again, that uh, pin 13 comes off of here and goes over to the transistors to uh, fire the push to talk lead. Okay. Might be the same thing if you can build something up uh, from ground zero. There's lots of plans out there on the internet. We talked about that few weeks back when I did my previous presentation. Um, another way to get uh, the push to talk lead, and we see this used in some of the older interfaces, is to use a communications port or a COM port, serial port, if you will, um, on, your, uh, on your computer. And typically what we do in that case is we toggle one of the control lines, the flow control lines on the, um, on the serial port, Usually we use the RTS line, which stands for request to send. That seems like an appropriate line to use to put my radio into transmit. <clears throat> so when that line goes active on the COM port, we just uh, take it through, um, you know, current limiting resistor here. And in this case, we're using an optical isolator. So when that line goes active, it, this LED will light up inside the optical isolator. And then we have a photosensitive transistor over here. And then this goes on out to the the, uh, the push to talk on the radio. You could just take this right into a transistor and, and bypass the optical isolator as well. Um, <clears throat> we do have to put a, uh, a diode in here because uh, the RS-232 specification uh, says that, uh, you know, this request to send line uh, when it's in the inactive state would be at minus 25 volts or minus 10 volts, somewhere around there. <clears throat> and when it's in the active state, it goes to plus 10 volts. Okay, so we don't want to reverse pull, uh, go reverse polarity on here so we put a diode in there to keep that from happening. Now of course uh, most of our computers these days won't have a COM port so this is actually going to be connected up to a USB to serial adapter uh, uh, typically uh, in our applications today. But virtually all of our software will support using a COM port to activate the push to talk lead. So this is one other way that we could do that. 
Okay, most many of our uh, newer radios, the multi-mode, multi-band radios, uh, have a built-in sound card interface, and so this is really a a, a nice way to go if you um, if you want to operate all of the bands and all of the modes. Uh, we just need a USB cable from your host computer going into the back of the radio here, and we have everything we need. The sound card interface is in there. Uh, the uh, the rig control cat or, or CIV is, is provided over that same cable as well. <clears throat> so this makes for a much nicer, much cleaner setup. Um, <clears throat> the, um, if, if you look in the schematic diagram or the block diagram of these radios, it, it really is a sound card interface in there. There's nothing special going on. Uh, when that USB cable comes in the back, the first thing it goes to is a USB hub. And on the other side of the USB hub, there is a sound card interface and the um, and, and usually a couple of VCP virtual COM ports, which are connected to the um, to the microprocessor in there for doing rig control and that sort of thing. <clears throat> so nothing special, no special DSP or anything like that going on here. It's just a sound card interface. And if you if you look, it's connected to the same place that the regular audio path uh, analog side of the audio path is in the radio. Uh, even if you're using a radio, you know, like a software-defined radio or something like that, it's still a sound card interface inside there. Now, the one thing that we have found on uh, a lot of these rigs uh, is that the audio bandwidth on the built-in sound card is usually limited to just the voice frequency. So it cuts off around three kilohertz. And again, that's going to uh, impact us for high-speed data operation. Uh, so it, it really won't do the fastest speeds uh, like VAR wide mode, <clears throat> but it'll certainly do VAR narrow mode and, and that may be perfectly acceptable for, for folks in many uh, cases. So this is a good option. <clears throat> okay, so when we hook up to a radio, there's really four signals that we're talking about that we need to provide um, or, or have a connection to the radio. Uh, number one is transmit audio, and again, that's an analog signal, analog audio, right? <clears throat> uh, uh, coming back from the radio, we need receive audio, okay? And again, that's an analog signal. We have to have the push to talk function, which puts our radio into transmit mode, and that that is literally just DC switching. It's typically taking the push to talk lead to ground, Okay, and that's provided again either by a COM port connection, a GPIO connection, or some kind of a box circuitry. And then finally, the ground reference for all of these things. And really, that's all we need. And it doesn't matter if you're doing a sound card interface, a TNC, uh, a PACTOR controller, th these are the connections that we make. Okay? <clears throat> Just that simple. Optionally, and strongly recommended if you're using the HF modes, is a uh, CAT or a CIV connection. Uh, what this allows us to do is um, do the frequency and, and mode setting on the radio automatically from the software. And optionally, we can also activate the PTT line uh, via CAT commands or CIV commands. Um, <clears throat> so if you have that option, if you're running a multi-mode rig, HF rig, um, then uh, it's strongly recommended that you also provide that connection as well. Uh, this is not available for FM modes. Uh, Winlink, um, so if, if you're operating, say, packet on, on two meters or VARA FM on two meters, uh, it is not going to set the frequency in the mode for you. The reason for that is typically we've been using FM radios and typically, you know, your typical mobile radio, something like that for a long time for packet operations and now for bar FM. Those radios typically do not have a CAT or CIV uh, connection to them. Uh, so the software has never been set up to provide frequency control or rig control on those modes. Now, we're getting a lot more rigs out there these days that, that do have this capability. And so maybe we need to look back at um, the software and see if we can get that added in there. But it is not there today. So if you fire up Winlink Express and you've got everything configured and you bring up a VARA FM connection and you say, OK, click and I want to connect to my favorite gateway, 
on uh, 145030 or something like that, it is not going to put the radio on that frequency. You have to do it manually. <clears throat> um, and if you, if you guys want to make a lot of noise on that, go up on the support forum and make a lot of noise about that. And maybe we'll convince the development team to add that functionality in there. Okay, how are we going to connect to the radio? Well, a <clears throat> couple of options. Um, <clears throat> number one is the uh, six pin DIN connector, the, uh, the, the so-called packet connector on our radio. If, you, if your radio is so equipped with one of those, this would be the best way to connect to it. Um, if, again, if you have that option, uh, and, and I prefer that you use the 9600 pins on there, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, if you don't have a six pin connector, there might be some sort of accessory connector that provides that connectivity. Uh, in the case of VHF and UHF radios, uh, like if we're using a, um, a commercial radio, a Motorola, a Tate, something like that, uh, they typically have an accessory connector on the back and it will provide those connections uh, via that connector. Uh, some of the multi-mode, multi-band radios won't have the six pin DIN, but they will have a accessory connector on the back for connecting up to an RTTY controller or something like that. And we can use that connector as well. And then finally, if all else fails, we can use the speaker and the microphone connectors. Um, this is not the, not the best way to go, but if that's the only option that we have, then that's the only option we have. We'll, we'll make use of that. Now, I have acoustic coupling there, and I have it crossed out. Um, I, you know, whenever I talk about this, there's always somebody in the room that says, well, wait a minute. Um, our group does FL Digi um, over the repeater, and we just hold the radio next to the, the laptop, and we use the speaker and the laptop and, and the microphone on the radio, and we send it that way. That's called acoustic coupling. Yes, it may work under ideal conditions. Um, I would never put this into my emergency plan. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is the connectivity of absolutely last result, re, re, uh, you know, uh, this is the MacGyver way, right? You know, nothing else is working and we've got to, we have to send a digital message. Yeah, maybe you might get away with acoustic coupling, but not the right way to do it at all. <clears throat> okay, let's talk about the six pin DIN connector on the back of your radio. <clears throat> so I got a picture here. This is, a, I think it's an ICOM 7000 here. Uh, it has both an accessory connector and a data connector. Okay, and this is the, the data connector that we're going to talk about, the six pin connection here. Now, this was, um, this was set up for primarily for packet radio um, <clears throat> back in the day. And the manufacturers, um, I don't know if, if they actually got together on this or if it just happened, but they standardized on which pins would do which function. That's good. That's the good news. So. Any six pin DIN connector, it's gonna have these six pins. Pin one is always gonna be the data in. Pin two is always gonna be ground. Pin three is gonna be push to talk. Four and five will be the receive audio, uh, either 9600 or 1200. And then pin six um, is the squelch indicator. Okay. Uh, what is not standard uh, is what those signals look like. But, um, <clears throat> Uh, you'll notice that we have two leads here for receive audio, one at 9600 and one at 1200, but we only have one transmit lead, okay, and it does either 1200 or 9600. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so why did we do that? Well, we really should have used an 8-pin connector, <laughs> so we could have provided all of these connections, uh, but they didn't. They used a 6-pin connector, and so that means one of these is going to have to share a function, and they chose this one. Now, how do I select between 1200 and 9600? Well, you're gonna to have to go into the menu settings on the radio and flip a switch or change a menu setting that says, I'm going to be in 9600 mode. And that's going to change this lead right here, whether it's operating at 1200 mode or 9600 mode. Uh, these, these leads I have found on every radio I have checked are active all the time. Doesn't matter which way the switch is, uh, these leads are always active. The only thing that really seems to be changing is, is, uh, is the pin one connection. Okay, let's talk about what's really happening inside this connector. 
<clears throat> okay, first of all, it's used for analog signals, not digital. It's not, you know, we're not doing ones and zeros down there. We are sending analog audio down there or receiving analog audio from there. So just to be clear on that. And it's not really related to, even though it says 1200 baud and 9600 baud, it really has nothing to do with the data speed. Uh, when we use the 1200 connections, we are going through the same audio path in the radio that our regular voice connection does. So same audio path that the microphone takes, same audio path that the speaker takes. What that means is it's going to go through pre-emphasis and de-emphasis. Uh, it'll go through any CTCSS filtering. And its bandwidth is probably going to be limited to just voice frequencies, about three kilohertz, something like that. Okay. <clears throat> when we switch to the 9600 pins, our connections are going to go directly to the modulator and the discriminator on the radio. Okay. Uh, and bypassing all of that filtering, no pre-emphasis, de-emphasis, no CTCSS filtering, not, none of the other stuff there that's going on. It's going to go straight to those two points in the radio and we were going to get much better bandwidth there, maybe as much as six kilohertz. Okay? So that's going to allow us to do higher speed data. Remember that these radios, all of our ham radios are voice grade radios. That's what they are designed as. Uh, <clears throat> they, were, they are narrow band radios. They were never designed to be high speed data. So we're, we're pushing the limits here, uh, uh, especially with something like VARA FM. Uh, we're pushing the limits and we really need as much bandwidth as we can get to to get the speeds that we're seeing with RFM. So really use the 9600 connections if you have the option. Always going to be better. Okay, again, our pin assignments are standard between, between manufacturers. Pin one is always transmit data. Pin two is always ground. But what we don't know is what the impedance is or the voltage level is expected um, on these um, on these different lines. So different manufacturers will do different things there. Uh, they may or may not document it in the, in the manual. Um, they, it may change even from uh, one model to another from the same manufacturer. So you really have to experiment a little bit and do some adjusting to find the, the appropriate levels for a particular radio. Um, <clears throat> It'd be nice if uh, this connector went through, you know, an IEEE spec or something like that, and we always knew exactly what the signals should be, then it would be real easy to set up radios. Uh, but that's not what happened, and it's up to the manufacturer to decide what they're going to do there. <clears throat> It'd be really cool if there's somebody out there who likes to write databases or something like that, we, if we, we could, uh, you know, put an online database or a website or something like that that, you know, said, uh, I've got a, uh, a Kenwood uh, TMD710 and I'm using a signal link um, and I want to do VARA FM, what, what, is, what are the setup that I have to do? And we can present all of that information. Uh, nobody's doing that yet today, but I'll just put the bug out there. If you're a, a database kind of person, you'd like to support something like that, that would be really cool. And then over time, we could, we could put that information in there and uh, it would make it much easier for folks in the future. Okay, so if I don't have this cool six pin DIN, <clears throat> um, then I'm kind of limited to the microphone connector on the front of the radio and the external speaker jack on the back of the radio. And like I said, these will work, but limited bandwidth, so you're not gonna get the highest data rates um, uh, you know, using VARA. Uh, you'll be stuck on VARA narrow <clears throat> and uh, and may not even get the highest speed out of our narrow, uh, depending on the radio involved. Uh, just to be different, Alinko uses a DB9 connector instead of a six pin DIN. Uh, that's okay. Um, since they have nine pins, uh, we could actually put two pins for uh, 9600 and two pins for 1200, and that's what they do. So there's, you know, here's data in and data out on 9600, and these other two pins down here are data in, data out for 1200. Uh, so that's kind of that's kind of handy if you're using one of those radios. And then uh, to be really different, on some of the newer Yesu rigs, they have this 10-pin mini DIN on the back of it, and it's got a bunch of other stuff that it can do. So you can hook it up, and you can you know hook up a if it's got uh, APRS in there, you can put the GPS data go go 
coming in through that connection, uh, the memory setting and all of that stuff goes through that connection, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> but if you just want to use it for, uh, you know, hooking up your TNC or your sound card interface, well, good luck finding this 10 pin DIN and getting a, you know, a cable made for that. But they will sell you at optional, this uh, CT-164 cable, which has the 10 pin DIN on one end and on the other end, it has our standard six pin DIN connection. <clears throat> so that's really good for Yesu. They get to sell this probably for $40, $50 and make a little bit of extra money. So again, if you're stuck with the uh, speaker and mic connections, uh, again, we're gonna have limited bandwidth available. Uh, these are optimized for voice communications, not data. And so we're gonna be stuck with, uh, you know, maybe cutting off at three kilohertz on the high end and it's gonna filter off all the CTCSS at the low end. <clears throat> so we have a much, much narrower bandwidth available to us. And of course, um, it'll go through this pre and de-emphasis uh, filter as well. Um, <clears throat> uh, and again, if you're using the 1200 pins on the six pin connector, it's doing the same, it's taking the same audio path as our speaker and mic connections. The only thing different about that is that the volume control is bypassed and you get a, a set level coming out of the, the 1200 pins. Okay, so 9600 pin is the connection we want to use if we can. Uh, again, these go directly to the modulator and the discriminator. It bypasses all the filtering and the pre-emphasis and de-emphasis. It's going to get us our maximum bandwidth. Okay? Um, that does typically require a little bit more drive on the transmit audio lead because uh, you're going directly to the modulator and that typically takes a bit more drive. It, it's not going through the microphone preamp circuits and all of that. So um, <clears throat> Uh, that can be an issue depending on the uh, type of device you're hooking up, the sound card interface. If it doesn't have enough drive, uh, you may not be able to uh, drive it to the full deviation that we'd like to see. <clears throat> okay, I just want to talk a little bit about pre and de-emphasis in case you, you're not familiar with that. All of our FM rigs do this for, uh, for voice and uh, it's really designed to improve the signal to noise ratio on our voice signals, but it's bad for data. <clears throat> and really what's happening here is we've got our modulating signal coming in, you know, from the microphone preamp or whatever, and we're gonna pass it through what is essentially a high pass filter. And then off to the FM modulator and then transmit it out over the air. What that essentially does, um, <clears throat> if we look at the audio bandwidth here, we're going to be fairly flat up to a point and then at some point wherever the filter uh, design criteria is we're going to start um, increasing the high frequencies at about 60 db 6 db per octave so every doubling of the frequency we're going to go up by 60 db and we'll increase the amplitude by 60 db this is kind of like turning the treble control on your stereo all the way up okay now, you're going to say, well, Scott, wouldn't that make it really tinny sounding? Yes, it would, unless you didn't go through, if you didn't go through de-emphasis on the receive end. So that's what we do. On the receive end, the signal coming from the demodulator goes through what is essentially a low-pass filter. And that low-pass filter then reduces the high frequency by that same 6 dB per octave. So it's the opposite of what we did over here. This is kind of like turning the treble control all the way the other way on your stereo. <clears throat> okay, so the net result is the sound should be where, where it started at, right? We should cancel out these two slopes, but by decreasing the high frequencies significantly on the receive end, we are also removing the high frequency noise, the hiss that is, uh, you know, apparent in, a, in, in an FM signal. Okay, so it's going to improve the signal to noise ratio quite substantially. This is just like Dolby uh, for tape, right? Uh, on, when you turn on Dolby for tape, we, we boost the high frequencies when we record and we reduce the high frequencies when we play back and we get rid of the tape hiss. Um, that's exactly what's going on here. Uh, don't look at these numbers. Uh, this is the slope curve for broadcast FM. I couldn't find one for, uh, uh, I couldn't find a, a graph for uh, communications radios. <clears throat> but 
here's the here's the key. Whenever you go through a, a an RC circuit like this, uh, you're going to mess up the the phase a little bit. Okay? You're gonna, there is going to be a phase change, and for voice, you know, it doesn't matter. We can't hear it in our with our ears. It sounds just fine. But when we're doing, you know, QAM 256 or something like that, which is what, you know, VARA might be doing, those little phase changes can really mess us up. Okay, so uh, again, uh, when we're doing higher speed data, we really don't want to go through pre-emphasis and de-emphasis. We want to keep it flat. So I say always use the 9600 pins. Just always use the 9600 pins, even if you're doing 1200, even if you're doing 1200 baud packet. Now, somebody's going to say to me, well, now, wait a minute, Scott, if I'm doing flat audio and the guy at the other end of the link is hooked up to his speaker and mic jacks, you know, isn't that going to introduce an error? <clears throat> well, yes, it is. Um, but it doesn't seem to be significant at the lower speed data. Um, it just doesn't seem to make that much difference. So if you're really concerned, you could uh, connect to the receive 9600 pin and then leave the radio in 1200 if you're actually uh, running 1200 instead of switching it to 9600. And then you would be sending pre-emphasized um, signal and then getting flat audio for the receive side. And all of our software seems to handle it just fine. Okay, um, <clears throat> handheld radios. Some folks want to use handheld radios for data. Um, you can do it. I don't necessarily recommend it, um, and here's my reasons for not recommending it. First of all, your duty cycle uh, is probably going to be exceeded. Okay, uh, if you're sending a, a long message on packet or maybe several messages back to back on packet, you're going to have key down times that may be several minutes long, uh, and really that's going to exceed the duty cycle of just about every HT out there. And what what does that mean? Well, it's going to heat up. It's going to get very hot. If any, any of you have operated your HT for a long time, done a lot of transmitting, you'll know how hot they can get. And there's just not any place to dissipate that heat in the handheld. There's not a great big heat sink on the back of it like you're going to see on, on a mobile radio. So uh, on a good radio, it'll probably shut down. It'll have a uh, temperature sensor in there and it'll say, oh, I'm getting too hot time to turn off and it's going to just shut off the radio right in the middle of the transmission and you got to let it cool down before it's going to turn on again. Uh, if you've got a cheap radio, like maybe a Chinese one, costs you $35, uh, you're probably going to damage the radio and you'll have to spend another $35 to replace it. <clears throat> uh, so duty cycle, that's a problem. Also, since you're using relatively low power, uh, your range is going to be limited. You know, you're going to be stuck with maybe a five watt radio. I, I know some of the new Chinese radios are making eight watts. Uh, uh, you know, at eight watts, it's gonna get hot really fast and it's gonna eat up the battery really fast. So, uh, but at any rate, you're gonna have pretty limited range, uh, especially if you're using the rubber duck antenna. If you're, if you're trying to get somewhere, you know, a, even more than a couple miles uh, using the rubber duck antenna on a handheld, it's just not gonna work. Um, so, I, you know, and the other problem with using the rubber duck is um, you're going to get, uh, it, it's high probability you'll get RF back into the USB cable or, or the, uh, uh, the cables connecting your interface to the radio and, and that's going to cause you trouble as well. <clears throat> so if you are going to use a, an HD, then definitely you want to be using an external antenna and get it as far away from the, the equipment as you can. And then finally, uh, you know, your connections are going to be to the speaker and mic jack. So, you know, your data speeds are going to be limited, just like we've, we've been talking about here. There's only one radio that I know of uh, that actually provides 9600 connections, and that's the Kenwood TH-F6A, which is now discontinued. Uh, you could switch that over into, uh, into 9600 mode, and it actually works pretty good at 9600, but I don't know of any other radio that does that. Uh, some radios do have a built-in box circuit. Some of the handhelds do. Do not use that for data. Please do not use that for data. And here's the reason why. Um, it, is, it has a fixed delay, uh, usually about a second and a half, maybe two seconds long. So <clears throat> when you use that uh, box circuit, uh, when you finish sending data, your radio is going to stay and transmit for another second and a half to two seconds. 
And during that time, station at the other end has probably replied to you and you've missed the reply because you're still in transmit. So that Vox circuit just does not work for data operation. So please do not use that. <clears throat> okay, we've got a lot of different connectors available for our, um, our handheld radios. Uh, I just kind of talk about a couple of these here. This is the fairly common one. I've seen this on Yaesu radios mostly. Uh, this is called a TRRS tip ring ring sleeve connector. <clears throat> and um, they're typically uh, three, three and a half millimeters, 3.5 millimeters. And so all of our signals would be, you know, remember I said we need four signals. Well, I got four connections here, so we're good to go. Uh, the more common are these, uh, where we have a pair of, uh, uh, you know, 3.5 millimeter and a 2.5 millimeter connector. And they're typically, you know, this is tip sleeve or tip ring sleeve TRS uh, type connections. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are at least two flavors of those. Uh, this is kind of the, um, the, what I'll call the ICOM flavor. This is kind of the Kenwood flavor here. Um, the difference is you can see, you know, we've got tip and ring here. And here we have tippering sleeve, and, and it's just the opposite on this one. Um, also, uh, the spacing between these two is different between these two connectors. So make sure if you're ordering one of these, that you're ordering the correct connector for your radio. <clears throat> um, we don't need to use all of these connection points. Uh, so uh, some of them may not have, um, uh, you know, tippering sleeve. Uh, it may not matter because we probably have what we need. Push to talk is the main thing that we get hung up on on the HTs. Um, some of them do provide a separate push to talk connection. So this is the typical Kenwood connection on the 3.5 millimeter plug. The sleeve is push to talk. So if you pull that to ground, uh, it puts the radio into transmit. Uh, probably more common is this arrangement here, where uh, to put the radio into transmit, uh, we actually take the mic lead. Uh, to ground through about a, a 2K uh, resistance. And uh, the radio detects that. There's, a, there's always a, a DC voltage on the mic lead here because we're using uh, condenser microphones. So um, <clears throat> there's a little bit of uh, voltage there and the radio can detect when it gets loaded a little bit and it says, okay, time to go into transmit mode. So in that case, you're going to need to have a capacitor and a resistor wired into that uh, connection to make that work. Uh, the Kenwood radios, uh, like I said, just have a direct connection here to, for push to talk. Uh, Kenwood and Baofeng are the same. Uh, this is uh, typical of Yesu and, and ICOM and Alinko <coughs> radios. Okay, so before we go there, let me, uh, I'm gonna stop my share here for a second. Oops. Turn off my widget. Uh, we'll do a little bit of show and tell here for a sec. Um, <clears throat> I don't really see any hands up, so we don't have any questions there, but chat has been going crazy. Okay, we'll, we'll answer those questions here in a sec. Okay, you can see my hands, right? <laughs> we'll just talk about a couple of these different interfaces. Again, here's, uh, you know, here's our friend, the signal link. Okay, uh, nice thing about the signal link, we've got the uh, transmit level and the receive level right on the front here. Um, this delay control, please turn that all the way down all the time, never use it for, uh, uh, for digital modes. And then on the back, uh, we have the USB connection here, and then going off to the radio, they utilized a um, RJ45 connector. Okay. Uh, now, SignalLink uh, did kind of an interesting thing here. This is a, you know, an RJ45 is an eight pin connector. And so uh, inside, uh, they put this jumper block in here. And I don't know if you can see the numbers there. Um, <clears throat> over on this side, it goes one through eight. So this side of the jumper block is directly connected to the, to our RJ45 connector. Now, on this side of the jumper block, we have our speaker, mic, push to talk, and a bunch of ground connections. And then you make these jumper connections however you want them for however this connector is uh, wired for the cable for your radio. <clears throat> um, 
And then they came out with this clever idea. Well, we'll sell you these little modules that you can plug in. So you can buy a module for your radio instead of putting these jumpers in, you just plug the module in and then you plug your cable in and you're good to go. Well, that just doesn't make any sense at all to me because uh, why would we, you know, every time I want to change radios, I got to open this thing up, pull this module out, put a different module in here and plug a different cable in here. I don't do it this way. Mine are jumpered straight across and then I change the cable wiring for whatever radio that I'm going to use. That makes a lot, heck of a lot more sense to me and it's cheaper. Um, by the way, if any of you have taken apart a signal link, you'll know that looking at mine here, you'll know it's been modified because I've got some additional wiring in here. And of course, these transformers are like way bigger than the ones that uh, Tigertronics used. Um, in an attempt to get better bandwidth out of it, I've, uh, I've done a bunch of modifications on here. Still doesn't work great at uh, VAR or wide speeds. <clears throat> okay, um, other options. These are a couple of uh, different uh, DRA devices from Masters Communications. So on one end, again, we've got the USB connection. On the other end of this one, for example, we, we're using a, a DB9 connector and this DB9 connector is wired the same way as a Cantronics TNC. So if you've got, you already have a cable wired up for your radio that talks to a Cantronics TNC, you can plug it directly into here and it's already wired the correct way. You're good to go. <coughs> um, this is a, uh, I think it's the DRA 36. I'd have to look inside for sure. But again, USB connection here and then six pin DIN connector on this side. Okay, so this is the same wiring as the six pin DIN on the back of the radio. So all I need to use is a straight through cable, which you can get really inexpensively and plug that in and you're good to go. Um, here's the, um, this is the rim light, little tiny guy here. So micro USB on the back side and then uh, a connector that's customized for whatever radio application that you're going to use. In this case, this is the Motorola one. So this goes to the Motorola uh, standard accessory connector on the back of the Motorola radio. So this just plugs right into the back of the radio and you plug the USB in here and, and we're on the air, good to go. <clears throat> um, talking about cables here a little bit. <clears throat> a couple of different cables. So Here's one that I, and I build all my own cables. I don't trust anybody to build my cables for me. So I just do my own, but <clears throat> uh, in this case, I've got a six pin DIN here, okay? And the other end of it is an RJ45. So this is gonna go right to my signal link, okay? And then this into the six pin DIN connector on the back of my radio. Now this could be wired for either 1200 or 9600, okay? So um, if you look at this cable, it says 1200. So this one is wired for 1200. I have another one that's wired for 9600. <clears throat> okay, one option there. Here's, um, here's a um, one wired up for one of my DRAs here. So again, DB9 connector, it's gonna go plug into the DRA and then I have a six pin dim on the other end of this one. Okay. And actually, I don't, I was silly on this one. I don't know whether this is wired for 1200 or 9600. I didn't put a label on it. So I'll have to figure that out the hard way. <laughs> um, here's an HT cable. This is going to go to my, my Kenwood radio. So again, it's got the DB9 here. So that's going to connect to uh, my DRA in this case. And then the, uh, the 3.5 and 2.5 are going to plug into uh, the HD into the into the microphone jack on the HD, <clears throat> and I don't even see this, but just in case you didn't believe me, can you read the panel there? You'll see that it's set for packet 9600. So yes, you can switch it back and forth between 9600 and uh, <clears throat> and 1200. Okay, and then here's the ugly cable. <clears throat> so in this case. I've got an RJ, or excuse me, a um, DB9 again on this end. So again, plugging into my DRA here. And on the other end of this one, I've got a RJ45 that's going to plug into the mic jack on one of my radios. And going around to the back of the radio, I've got the 3.5 millimeter uh, jack to plug into the speaker jack in the back. 
And this, and this one I have, again, labeled, this is for my IC2200, uh, which does not have a data jack on it. So my only option for that one was to go into the mic and speaker jacks. Okay. And let's see, here's that radio. Okay, 2200, mic jack on the front, back panel, no data jack. All I got are external speaker jacks here. So my only option there, speaker and mic jacks, okay. Kind of oldie but goodie here, uh, Kenwood TM733. So it has the data jack right on the front, six pin data jack right on the front of the radio. Okay. So you can plug into, into there, okay. And if I'm using something like the DRA 36 here. I can just get one of these cables. So again, you can get this off of uh, uh, Amazon or eBay, even Masters Communications will sell you one of these. So six pin in to six pin in, both males. Well, they have one sitting out here, out of the bag, but I guess they don't. <clears throat> and so that's gonna plug into here and then plug into the front of this guy. No special cable needed. This is, you know, five bucks off of uh, off of Amazon. Okay. And the other thing I do with these, if I'm going to do some customizing, I'll buy one of these, cut it in half. Now I've got two six-pin connectors, and then I can wire up, uh, you know, the DB9s to go to something else. Um, if I'm using uh, like one of these DRAs that uses a DB9, so very easy way to switch back and forth that way. <clears throat> okay. Let's get the last couple of slides here and then we'll open it up for uh, questions. <clears throat> okay, so very important <clears throat> is uh, we need to do, when we set up the software, I know it's kind of a busy uh, slide here, but uh, we need to select the, uh, the sound card interface and we need to select how we're gonna do push to talk, okay? And so this is VARA FM here. We're gonna go into the settings and then bring up the VARA setup and we'll plug in our call sign information in here. Um, and he'll give you this little uh, drawing on here and say, are you gonna do wide or are you gonna do narrow? And <clears throat> Let me turn my uh, laser back on here. Um, and he says, you know, if you're gonna use the 9,600 pins on this six pin connector, then you can go wide. If you're gonna use the 1,200 pins, then you gotta go narrow. And that's selected right here. Okay. Um, notice that the, uh, the new version of VARA uh, provides a digipeter function as well. Okay. And then, then we're gonna go settings and sound card, and we're gonna select our sound card device. It's, gonna, it's almost always gonna be a USB audio codec, something like that, unless you rename it. <clears throat> and in the case of uh, doing one of our C media devices here, then you're gonna have the push to talk option over here to uh, select. Um, again, you can do settings and PPT, and if I'm using a DRA board, we would select this. Now, if I'm not using a DRA board, if I'm using a uh, signal link, I'm going to select Vox over here, okay? which essentially says, you know, VAR is not going to do anything with the push to talk lead. It's going to be developed off of the, uh, the Vox circuit inside the signal link. Or if I'm using a COM port, like I talked about, you could select that here, and then it would give me the option to tell it which COM port that I'm going to be utilizing. And finally, if you're using cat commands or CIV, then you select this, and then it's gonna ask you for the uh, communications port and the com communications parameters uh, for that device if you're gonna be using. You'll have to select which rig it is and all of that. <clears throat> okay. Uh, again, just, um, again, reiterating what I just said, you know, you, in uh, VAR, you're gonna select which type of push to talk function you're gonna be using. Uh, here's uh, for packet, if you're using uh, UZ7 sound modem, uh, again, under the settings and, and device settings in here, uh, you're going to select the input and output device. In this case, I've got a DRA30 that I'm utilizing. And then for push to talk, 
you have um, all of those different options here. If I'm, gonna, if I'm using a, a DRA type of device, I'm gonna set this to external, and then you'll get this little pop up here and you get to select which one it is, okay? if you have more than one sound card there. Uh, you can also select none here if you're utilizing Vox, so that's what you would select for like a signal link. Or you can select uh, a COM port if you're using a COM port, you'll have all the COM port options in here and you can uh, select that as well. And you can also do CAT or, or um, CIV here as well, you would select that. <clears throat> and then there'll be under the advanced settings here, you have to set up the rig specific information uh, for utilizing that. <clears throat> Okay, um, worst case scenario, if you can't get push to talk working any other way, then we have to do this um, uh, CAT 7200 uh, hack, if you will. <laughs> so we, uh, we simulate a, uh, a communications port and point it to the, uh, the GPIO pin in the uh, DRA device uh, over on this side. It's a little bit complicated to get this all set up and working, but it does work. Uh, really, we only need this nowadays. We only need this for Dire Wolf or um, FL Digi, and we're trying to get the author of those two programs to add direct support for, uh, for the DRA type devices so we don't have to do this anymore. <clears throat> and it's real important to get this, the uh, transmit and receive settings adjusted correctly. And unfortunately, there's a lot of ways you can do that and they all affect each other. So I, I, again, this is a busy slide, but uh, this is our uh, sound settings from the Windows operating system. Uh, so when we select our device, so again, we've selected the USB plug and play device here. Um, the playback tab here controls our transmit level. The recording tab is our receive level. Okay, so in this case, I've got the recording tab selected and I brought up the uh, level slider on here, and this is my receive level. I can adjust this up and down, and it's going to adjust this receive level here. <clears throat> okay. um, for uh, transmit, then you're going to switch over to playback, and you can select the level there and adjust the slider there, and that's going to set your, play, your uh, transmit level. Now we also, if you're using a signal link, you've got a hardware control here for transmit level and the hardware control here for receive level. These also affect the level. Or if you're using something like a DRA here, you've got these uh, pots inside of here. R12 is the receive level, R14 or R16, depending on how you have it jumpered, is the transmit level. Okay, so all of these will affect it. And then finally on VARA itself, they have a drive slider in here and that's gonna affect the transmit level. So all of these things are going to change your, your uh, transmit and receive levels. So it's a balance of getting all of them right. Where I don't like to have my, any of my sliders all the way pegged, you know, either all the way down or all the way up. This one all the way up, all the way down, or these turned way down to almost nothing or turned way up to all the way up. So work it so you get, you know, this control kind of in the mid range or this control kind of in the mid range and it's going to take a little bit of playing to do that now fortunately with um, vara we now have this auto tune function which helps you get that completed <clears throat> um, the the receive part is really easy to do on the receive side all we have to do is open the squelch on the radio and then watch you know either the waterfall if you're using a packet you know like sound modem or using the uh, audio input meter here on, on VARA. And we're just gonna set the level about where it is here, 13, 12 or 13. I like it, you know, kind of right out at this last bar out here uh, before we go down into the red zone. <clears throat> that seems to work pretty well. And that's it, pretty much you're set on the receive level. The transmit level, much more complicated. Really, we need test equipment Okay. We need to have a deviation meter or a, a, sig a, a service uh, monitor or something like that to actually look at the deviation and see what we're doing. Unfortunately, most of us don't have that kind of equipment available to us. So um, uh, Jose has added this um, auto, you know, auto tune function uh, in Devara to help us do that. So in that case, you're going to plug in the call sign of a station 
hopefully nearby you that is set up correctly. <coughs> and um, they don't have to have any software running other than VARA. Once, they're, once VARA is up and running, you can put their call sign in there and click the plug button here. And it's going to send a test, uh, a series of test um, blocks to the receiving station, changing the level a little bit with each block. And then at the end of that, the other station is going to send back and say, you know, which which setting was the best setting, and then you, your uh, VAR will automatically adjust the level to that setting. And this is what you want to get. You want to get approved and everything green here, looking good. Um, if you if it's not an approved level, uh, it's going to tell you what to do. If you if you set up uh, for a Vox type device, it assumes you're using a signal link and it will show you a picture of the signal link and it will say, turn this knob up or turn this knob down and try it again. Okay? And if you're using a DRA, it's going to say, okay, turn this pot up or turn this pot down until you, and run it again until you get to the approved level. Okay? So that's, it's not a perfect function, um, but it gets you in the ballpark gets you pretty close and uh, usually what I do if I want to maximize it I might tweak the levels I might turn this up a little bit or turn it down a little bit while I'm sending a really big block of data and I'll be looking at this signal to noise meter uh, which is actually kind of behind this slide you can't see it but what I'm trying to get is signal to noise up in the high 20s or maybe even in, in the 30s there uh, if I get it up in that range, then I'm going to be getting the best performance out of it. If you're getting uh, signal to noise readings down, you know, below 10, um, you're going to be suffering uh, performance wise. And so it takes a little bit of tweaking to get that in there. But it does require a little bit of testing to get this right. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I've had too many people say, well, I hooked it all up and I did a connection to a remote station and it worked and so everything's good. No, you need to go test it out and you need to make sure that you've got the level set correctly. Okay, um, that's my slides. So let's talk about uh, questions. Anybody have some questions? And I'm sure there's a bunch in the, in the chat here. Most of the questions were answered by the people in the chat. They're okay, very, very excellent. I like it when that happens. <laughs> have you documented your signal link mods anywhere? Well, um, I haven't documented my mods, but I got them off the internet. So um, if you do a, um, a Google search on, you know, single link mods, you'll find uh, many, many uh, hits on that. And uh, basically what you're doing, uh, the modifications you're doing, there's a couple things that single link did wrong in the earlier revisions. Uh, first of all, they took power off the USB bus and they didn't clean it up. Uh, so you, you kind of have to clean up the, the uh, USB power bus. Um, that's not too difficult to do. It's just putting a ferrite bead on there. Uh, the other thing they did, they, the, uh, again, they took the uh, USB um, power and, and used that to bias their, uh, their preamps in there. And uh, that's not really a good idea either because the USB bus can fluctuate a little bit. And so you really don't want your bias fluctuating around. Uh, so it's fairly easy. Um, they do have regulated voltage in there. It's fairly easy to tap into the regulated voltage and, and put a proper bias on there. And then the last thing is changing out the transformers, and that's really a pain in the neck. Um, there's there's not a really good set of transformers that have their, for the through hole circuit boards. Um, most of the other transformers that have better specifications uh, don't fit perfectly in there. You have to kind of tweak things a little bit to, to make them fit. Um, <clears throat> uh, Signal, or excuse me, Tigertronics has made all of these changes in the latest revision. Um, they, they cleaned up the power bus and they redid the bias on the, on the preamps. And they are using different transformers in there now. They're now using surface mount uh, transformers. They're actually physically smaller than the other one, than the, uh, uh, the original ones. And um, I, I don't see how that works, because to me, you've got to have physically bigger transformers to get a bigger, better bandwidth without saturation. Um, <clears throat> but they seem to think that the smaller ones work better. Um, and, you know, uh, they've gotten better results. I still don't see consistent, uh, consistently good results with our wide mode using uh, even the latest signal link. 
that's probably more than you wanted to hear, but um, <laughs> the answer is, you know, search Google, you'll find the answer. Okay. And someone wanted to know about the transmit power level. They recommended 20% or less power, and you'll have no trouble with the software. Otherwise, you'll overdrive it. Is that correct? Okay. So um, I, I assume that question is talking about uh, HF modes. Uh, so in, in, in the FM modes, you're going to use whatever power it takes to get, you know, from point A to point B. Uh, on the HF modes, what we're really uh, looking at is uh, the uh, ALC level, and and that's you know that's the good news on on the HF modes. We can actually see we we have a good idea of what the transmit drive is by looking at the ALC level. We can't do that on FM. That's why I said with FM you really need to have a you know test equipment or something like that. On HF. You know, we can look, we can, while we're transmitting, we can look at the ALC meter and we know how hard we're driving the transmitter. We really want to set that for very minimum ALC action. Um, if you're using like RDOP or, or you know, Winmore or, or, or those modes, you really want almost no ALC action at all. VARA HF actually wants a little bit of, um, of ALC action. So, uh, I, I believe he even shows the picture on the screen there when you're setting it up. You know, I want about a third scale on, on ALC. <clears throat> um, you know, so whatever power level you end up with when you get the ALC right is, is probably going to be good enough. You're probably going to be in the 25 to 35 watt range and typically that's good enough. Now some rigs will allow, some rigs can set the carrier separate from the, uh, from the, um, uh, from the drive. And so you can still get low ALC, but still be putting out 100 watts, for example. Um, probably you don't need to do that. Uh, most of our connections, you know, unless the band is really, really in bad shape, uh, you can probably get by with, uh, I would say, 50 watts at the most. Probably most of the time I'm running in the 35 watt range and, and I, I can establish pretty good connections that way. Okay. What about a rig blaster advantage relative to a signaling? I say that one again. A rib blaster advantage relative. Oh, blaster advantage. Okay, so um, you know I don't have any experience with the rig blaster advantage, but I don't see any reason why it shouldn't work just fine. Um, the um, you know I don't know what um, I haven't looked inside to see or you know looked at the schematic to see what audio chip they're using, but um, you know it it should be just fine. I believe it does use uh, transformer isolation. Uh, so it's probably not going to get uh, the highest bandwidth and therefore the highest speeds on something like bar FM. Uh, <clears throat> but it, it, you know, it should work fine for narrow modes and in uh, the lower speed modes. Uh, I don't see any reason that it should. <clears throat> okay. On setting drive levels for Vera or Vera FM, what's the feasible maximum? Feasible maximum. Well, <laughs> Uh, so on, uh, on the FM modes, uh, you really don't want it to get much above three kilohertz of deviation on the radio. Um, probably less than that is going to be more optimum. Uh, usually when I set up a VAR FM wide radio, uh, once I get it performing uh, at the highest uh, signal to noise ratio, if I look at it with my signal analyzer uh, or my service monitor rather, um, I, it's almost always about 2.5 to 2.8 kilohertz of deviation. Um, <clears throat> driving it any harder than that, not going to make it any better. Um, and, and again, on, uh, on the HF modes, um, you know, you're going to be looking at the ALC meter and setting it for, uh, you know, about a third scale on the ALC meter. Driving it harder than that is just going to, you know, it's going to ruin your data rate. You know, your your throughput's going to go down. So, um, I, I don't know how to answer what the theoretical maximum is, but you, know, um, you you don't want to get anywhere near the maximum. You want to be way down from the maximum. Okay, that seems to answer all of the questions that haven't been answered in the chat. Lots of comments about great presentation, and thank you. Okay. All right. Well. Last chance. Any other questions? Hit them now. Or, or what I would uh, what I would tell you to do, um, if you come up with additional questions after this, uh, go to uh, you know go to the forums, uh, Winlink uh, Programs Group on Google, uh, 
is probably the one that I would uh, send you to. Uh, there are uh, there is also a uh, WinLink Programs group on Groups.io. I kind of watch both of those, um, but I lean a little bit more towards the Google Group one that just seems to get more activity. So um, if you post on the other one, I'll see it eventually. But uh, there are several of us uh, that that watch that um, that have a lot of experience, and uh, you know we're happy to work with folks and and. Uh, try to answer your questions and usually we can you know between uh, the few of us that uh, are regulars and or somebody who's uh, uh, somebody else who's got the same rig set up we can usually get the, uh, the questions answered one thing I will say um, you know a lot of times uh, the question will come up you know I've got the uh, the brand new icom XYZ rig and there's not you know there's not a setting for it in winlink why isn't there a setting for it in winlink well, uh, probably because we don't have that rig and we haven't had a chance to test that rig. And unfortunately, ICOM doesn't just send us test radios to uh, check out and see <laughs> how they work with, uh, with the different Windlink programs. So, you know, until somebody um, gets one of those radios and plays with it a bit and then, you know, posts up there, hey, this is how you have to set this particular rig up, it might be a while before we get the answer. Uh, <clears throat> Sorry, but that's the way it goes. I wish we had. I wish I had enough money to buy one of every rig, but I don't. <laughs> oh. I want to thank everybody in the chat. They provided some really. There were some good questions and some even better answers for a lot of people in the chat. Yeah, stuff about cable, where to get cables and uh, software and stuff like that. So, the chat and the video will be out probably sometime tomorrow, whenever Dan sends it out. If you well, it will and be added to the, the list of other uh, presentations we have to offer everybody. Scott, I really appreciate uh, you giving this presentation. It's a good one, as usual. Okay. Well, my pleasure. Can and you uh, the forum. <laughs> Can you send the presentation to me when you get down here? I will do that. Okay, appreciate one that. Other thing. If you're going to try to use the audio coupler mode, don't go into an EOC. If you do that in the EOC, you'll be out on your butt so fast, you have no idea. Because that will disrupt everybody in the EOC with, with the, the screeching noise. Yes. Yeah, I would agree with that 100%. Acoustic coupling really is not appropriate in, uh, in an emergency operation center. <clears throat> OK. I'd like to comment that after I close out the presentation, everybody goes away. And that's because I'm the host and I close it. But I have a set so you can come right back in. So if you want to meet, like going to a club meeting, if you want to come back, uh, just get back here in the Zoom session, talk to folks, get to meet people and uh, have a chat. I won't be changing this until probably tomorrow morning if we'll get ready for uh, our next Zoom thing we have to do. So unless there's some... We had about, we had a hundred and something people. hundred and thirty something at one point. Yeah. Yeah, real good turnout. It seems like Winlink is the magic thing here. Some people to fight it and some people to get on that wagon and go, go, go. So it's, uh, I, Winlink's got a lot to offer to folks when it's getting out there. All right, people are starting to fall off. Probably the people on the East Coast are falling asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Puerto Rico and those areas. So anyway, I am going to um, close this down unless somebody has something more. Okay, I'll say 73s, and again, I'll leave it. Uh, you can just connect back in if you want to just uh, chat with the folks and have a good time. 73s, and thank you all.